Hello, and thanks for tuning in to the third installment of the Grow Native webinar series. My name is Felicia. I'm the Outreach and Education Coordinator for the Missouri Prairie Foundation. We are excited this year to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Grow Native program with this webinar series and other events throughout the year. Um, Grow Native serves the, the whole lower Midwest. Um, today, we will be hearing from Paula Diaz about overcoming challenges of a suburban native plant gardener. Paula is the principal of Gardener Consultations, which provides designs incorporating native plants into traditional home and business landscapes. Paula was a University of Missouri Advanced Master Gardener who actively promoted native plant gardening through the Master Gardener Speakers Bureau. Paula was awarded the University of Missouri's highest volunteer honor in 2013 by being named to the MU Extension's Leaders Honor Roll. She's a past member of the Cass County MU Extension Council. She is a founding and current member of the Raymore Tree Board, a professional Grow Native member, serving on the Grow Native Education Committee, as well as a member of the Missouri Prairie Foundation, the Missouri Native Plant Society, and a partner of Deep Roots Kansas City. Paula has had several articles and tips appear in general gardening and native plant specific publications. She has been a featured speaker for Master Gardener and Missouri Department of Conservation programs, as well as Master Gardener certification and advanced education classes. Her passion is to create spaces which are ecologically benef beneficial and to share with others the joy of welcoming nature into our human spaces. If you have any questions for Paula throughout the presentation, please use the chat feature or the Q&A feature on your screen. And at the end, we will relay those messages to Paula. Be sure to tune in next week for Missouri Prairie Foundation Director of Prairie Management, Jared Hubner's presentation on establishing a prairie planting. Uh, that's at four o'clock next Wednesday. Okay, I will now turn it over to Paula. Good afternoon, everyone. I know that uh, you're probably wondering how will we address all of the different challenges that there are when we try to incorporate native plants into our suburban landscaping. But we're gonna hit on a couple of the top ones and then hopefully we'll be able to branch out from there. Assuming that the screens will change. So one of the things that you notice in the Grow Native logo is the tagline at the bottom that says, keeping nature near. When we think about preserving spaces for the other creatures of the world, sometimes we think about things like national parks or even Missouri Department of Conservation areas that have been set aside, things like that. But when you look at a nighttime map of the United States and you see the amount of light pollution that there is, that's a really good indicator to us of how much space we humans have altered because it's not simply the spaces that are lit up, there's also a lot of agricultural space that is no longer the habitat that the other creatures of our earth need in order to exist. So in order to help them get what they need, we're gonna go ahead and figure out how to make some habitat where we humans are and share that habitat. One of the great things about the Grow Native program, I'm gonna run through a couple of little things just because I wanna make sure you know what resources are out there. The best way to incorporate your native landscaping and have it be acceptable is to be really knowledgeable about the plants. Know what they do, know just like you would need to know for any kind of traditional gardening. You want to know what that plant is going to do as far as size, shape, texture, all those things. But we also want to know how is it going to interact with the other creatures that we're wanting to support. These tags that Grow Native provides are really educational. There's a whole pollinator buffet grouping as well. That helps you to understand what those specific plants do. However, one of the things that I have learned to overcome, or not, is that sometimes those tags are not quite as accurate as we would hope they would be. Kind of like if you have folks in your family that are, say, 5'3", and others are 6'3", and that same recipe created totally different sizes, we have a size range and sometimes it's rather frustrating even on those tags that'll say three feet to six feet. Holy cow, that's a big difference. 
And sometimes the tags will say, oh, full sun. And yet it'll also do really fine in a bit of shade. Um, sometimes we think something absolutely has to be a wetland species, so it's gonna need that wet space. But a lot of times those can also take the dry areas temporarily because they've evolved to know that we're gonna have July and August here in the Midwest and not only April and May when we have sufficient rain. So sometimes we have to learn things by experience, just with so many other things in life, we have to get out there and just give it a try. And sometimes we're gonna make mistakes. The resource guide is another really good piece of information you can actually, um, that's available on the website. You learn all different things about where you can buy the plants that you want, who knows those questions, the answers to those questions that you have, things like that, and some basic info. Another thing to be sure you're aware of is the Missouri Invasive Plant Task Force. A lot of people are not aware of what plants are invasive, even if some of us follow the uh, Missouri Native Plant Society Facebook page, you see a lot of times people recommend plants that are actually an invasive plant. So they take the space of where our native plants should be and that reduces the amount of habitat that we create. So we need to be aware that there might be things that we otherwise wouldn't have removed, like Japanese barberry is actually an invasive plant in our area. It's one that's really commonly used and wouldn't it be wonderful if once our tax dollars were being spent to remove an invasive species that the nurseries could no longer sell it? Well, we can hope for that in the future, maybe someday. Um, some of the other resources on the Grow Native website, you can find top 10 lists. There's 29 different ones. These are, this is an example of what the top 10 list looks like. You've got shade or semi-shade here, and then it gives you 10 of what some of the experts have profiled as their favorite plants for that site. There's also some landscaping plans. So if you're just really frustrated and trying to figure things out, these are actual little plotted out plans that you can utilize to help you get started. Sometimes the first step is the hardest step to take because as I oftentimes tell people, native plant gardening becomes addictive. Once you realize that you can bring the monarchs and their caterpillars to your yard, and then as I've heard that bug phrase as the gateway bug, once we get those, then we start wanting to get all the other caterpillars for all the other butterflies as well. So these plans are a really good resource to get started. When we're talking about taking these plants that grew in our native spaces, and we're gonna take these plants and put them into our spaces where we might have an HOA that has to regulate us, or we might have codes from our city that have to regulate us. One of the things that I think is really, really important when we're first beginning on this journey is we absolutely must frame what we're doing. If you can imagine the blobs of color up there on the right hand side and think about if you saw that you wouldn't know what it was. It looks like a mess. But if you look at it in a frame, then you think, oh, that's somebody's artwork. And if you frame something, even with a little rail fence, you can get away with putting something as typically unattractive as an old rusty stove in your front yard. So there's all kinds of different things that can become acceptable if we show that there is purpose and intent to them. And it's not just a lack of maintenance issue. Um, this particular person is a retired engineer. You might have guessed that once you see the slide rule. Um, his locality allows the residents to use the laser cutters and the 3D printers. And so not only did he just make signage to label his space so that it's obvious that it's an intended planting. In addition to that, he listed on this one is per, the particular one is his native plant hummingbird garden. And he listed all of the different plants on his sign that he has put into that garden. And then with the 3D printer, he made these cute little guys that he printed off in color coordinated, I might add, uh, for each of the different plants that he has planted. 
And when we're talking about dealing with codes and things, that's really important that we're able to identify what those plants are. And so if someone were to question us, we can say, look, this is what that plant is. This is what it does. And this is the nursery from which I purchased it. So things like that help us to be able to explain our perspective to others. Um, this subdivision you might notice is pretty barren. And you might think it's not necessarily the kind of place where native plants might be acceptable to use as landscaping because the very few plants that have been installed already for landscaping are extremely traditional. They've got the arborvitae, they've got the boxwoods, they've of course got the barberries and I hope no calorie pears because this one's new enough to know better. But this particular homeowner had some soil left over after they had a new patio installed. So by making this a very specific area in the middle of this big ocean of purposeless turf grass, they were able to make something that looks this conglomerated acceptable to the neighbors. They have people walk up and ask what things are and why they're doing that and what their purpose is. One of the things that they chose to do was to become certified as a Monarch Way Station. So they put the signage up and that really makes it visible to the folks that walk past on the public sidewalks that yeah, that's not just some place they didn't mow or they didn't clean up. That's a place that is intentionally using those particular plants for a particular purpose. And we mentioned messy. A lot of times that's the thing that a lot of people have against native plants. To me, I think if we can say that a landscape like this particular public space, um, this is here in the Kansas City area that I took this photo, that is acceptable to people. So if we can have that being acceptable and something as pedestrian and blah as something like this, which happens to be the Cass County MU Extension Office when, it, when we first moved in there, they had used that magic three shrubs um, and they paid someone to come and mow whatever stuff the ground cover is that's in there. There's not a whole lot of grass in there but they were paying somebody to come and mow every week. And this was the result of that money being spent. And then once the master gardeners had the opportunity to plant native plants in there, not only did we make it vibrant and beneficial to the other creatures in the environment, we also were able to incorporate some MU colors. And they ended up getting compliments all the time on how much better people enjoyed looking at this space than that previous three boxwoods and some green stuff. Signage, I think, is also really important. Um, this particular sign is an example of what you can order off of Missouri Prairie Foundation's website. It's something that helps people to understand that what we're doing is with purpose and with intent. And that's one of the things that we really need to convey if we want to make our style acceptable to others as well. For years, this has been the normal thing that we saw. Personally, I don't see this as particularly tidy. Um, it's kind, it's, it's, anymore when I see things like this, I don't see any beauty in them, even if it were like all knockout roses or something like that, because they're so sterile, they're so barren, they offer nothing other than eyeball candy. And even this, I don't, you know, they paid a lot of money to have this done. And it's not really what I would have paid money to, to want, would want to see after I paid that kind of money. However, it can be transformed without a whole lot of investment in restructuring it. We can still use that same structure. So we've put in around the little baby crab apple tree, we added some blue false indigo, and there's all kinds of purple poppy mallow, all kinds of really nice blooms that happen there. And they still have some texture and structure. We left the boxwoods back in the back and the little crab apple tree. So there's, there's a lot of things we can do. This example is one where um, this particular hillside here on the left was really steep and difficult to mow. So 
little by little, the existing plants were this uh, crab apple tree, there was a Rose of Sharon shrub, there was actually a little red bud tree, but little by little, this became this big kind of mulch island, and then small plants planted, it began to fill in, and it was very much accepted by the neighbors in that neighborhood. On the other side of this yard, here you can see that it has a specific framework, even though it's as simple as just a little brick edging, it shows that the plants that are inside of here are intended to be a garden. So we've got this one is that same previous photo where we were on the right hand side of the driveway. And there's the purple poppy mallow and the liatris and pale purple coneflower and there was all kinds of different beautiful native plants in there. All kinds of insects were in there, butterflies and bumblebees and etc. Um, so these are the little tiny things we can do that make it acceptable. This is when that bed had matured, the one that actually ended up being a rain garden. And you can see that we've got a pot in there with some annuals in it. Don't be afraid to fill in with annuals. Don't be afraid to incorporate some plants that people recognize from traditional landscaping, whether it's some daisies or whether you leave some boxwoods to be a border or structure for you. Try to follow some of those things where people can recognize that that's something they're familiar with as a garden and then they begin to learn about the other plants as well. Always, I always encourage the signage because it just explains to people the why without them having to drive back and forth wondering, hmm, why is that looking like that? Um, this is another one in a really high-end neighborhood where the right hand, or let's see, left hand side of the screen is what it started out as. You can see there's some holly shrubs and some green blobs and then there's what I always call the cousin it shrubs. Well this year the cousin it shrubs actually look really cool because they're surrounded by blooming rose verbena. We kept one holly shrub so that the folks when they sit on their front porch, they can still feel a little privacy in there while they're waiting for things to mature. Since we all realize that we start off with much smaller plants than you typically find at a nursery. Um, and this lady, in fact, was backing out of her garage and had a fright because there was a woman standing right up next to her driveway and the lady had seen the flowers blooming and decided she had to go up and see what they were because they were so pretty. And this is the kind of neighborhood where everything is all the same. You know what I'm talking about. All the different shades of beige. Forget shades of gray, it's the shades of beige that are these neighborhoods. Um, one of the other things I always try to emphasize to people is we're not looking for a perfect looking plant. A lot of times you see plants labeled as pest free or low maintenance, things like that. And anytime you're on a gardening forum, people are saying, oh, what's eating my this or that plant and how do I kill it? This plant to me is perfection. If you can see all these little cutouts here, you might see that and go, oh my gosh, something really trashed that plant. But for me, what I see is that this is these perfect little circles that these leaf cutter bees, and unfortunately it's kind of behind the little screen thing, but these guys come and with their mouth, they cut these perfect circles. Look at that, I could not do that with a scissors. And then what they do is they take that section of leaf and they take it into the little tube where they've laid their eggs because they fill up that tube by they lay an egg, they provision it with pollen, they put the leaf in there to block the rest of the passage, then they lay another egg and et cetera, all the way until they have it filled. It's just amazing to me how they can do that with their little tiny appendages. I could not cut that kind of a circle ever. Um, this is one of those things where that flower looks pretty beaten up, doesn't it? It's got some holes in the petals, whether this was from a hailstorm or whether it was from caterpillars munching on it, whatever it might have been from, it's still serving the purpose for this butterfly. And here on this shrub, this one is spice bush. 
and you can see, oh my goodness, those leaves are not perfect. They've got these big chunks out of them, and some of them are rolled up. Well, rolled up inside of there is the spice bush swallowtail caterpillar eating his little dinner or lunch, and that's where he hides. Unfortunately, this photo isn't showing up very well, at least on my screen behind the little squares of, of all the participants, but if you can see, the foliage looks pretty nasty, doesn't it? And yet, if you can see what I can't see on my screen at this point, there are some caterpillars on there. So that's because purple coneflower is not only a nectar source, it's also a host plant. So silvery checker spot caterpillars will be on there and they will decimate the foliage of the plants and it'll look like crud, but it will be serving the purpose for which we want it. This one is just a little example. This is a blackberry that I picked. Um, and you might notice this little caterpillar guy, but if we weren't paying attention, we probably would have just washed that off and down the drain. But that's actually a caterpillar right there. So we're not looking for perfect looking plants. We're looking for plants that we can see are serving the purpose for which we utilize them. That they're, they're beneficial not only to us humans for looking at, but they're also beneficial to the other creatures. This is a sign that I use um, to help explain to my neighbors why with my, we have right around 20 different types of oak trees on our little two acre property. And I don't mow those leaves. I don't rake up those leaves. Sometimes my husband has to because he has a different perspective, but he's learning. Um, but it also explains to my neighbors why I'm not doing that. It's not just because I am a lazy gardener and I want to do things like walk around and take pictures of the bugs and the flowers instead of having to do a bunch of maintenance and weed pulling, but it's also because this is the habitat in which many creatures overwinter. So if we're cleaning up every little bit of everything, there's no place for them to hide for the winter. There's no place for them to have shelter for the winter. And some of these little guys look like something you would never see if you were raking up leaves. So you might notice the monarch chrysalis here and another monarch chrysalis here, but how about the polyphemus moth right here? Did you notice that? Would you have noticed that if you were raking up leaves and that was in there or would it have gone in a bag? When I see this sort of landscaping anymore, not only does it not appeal to me aesthetically, but it also just tells me that it is an absolute desert. There is not a thing for any of our other creatures to eat. There might be some deer that will come and munch on things, but as far as insects and pollinators, there's nothing there. It's a food desert. We see all these little guys of boxwoods that are trimmed into little balls of green and now we've got mulch mixed with rock so that our gardens can be decorated by the mulch and the rock instead of decorated by the plants that we want to have in there. That's something that I haven't figured out yet who got that idea going. But to me and to most people throughout history, our gardens are to be filled with plants, plants that feed the other creatures as well as feed us. When did violets become a weed? Have you read any of the stories set in Victorian times where in the greenhouse violets were grown to be given as a gift of great love and great value? And now we call them a weed and we spray them and kill them and the people come and tell us that we should spray them and kill them. And on TV they tell us that we should not have anything other than a piece of grass in our lawn. And yet you don't have to mow violets, so you have more time to spend doing whatever else it might be. And if we have flowers such as this poppy mallow, we can see how much food is being provided right there versus the barren emptiness. It's also a matter of aesthetics. So for me, part of the aesthetic is that I want to see that there's value in the plant matter, that it's not just that desert, that wasteland. And I try to talk to people about art. All the things on this page are considered to be art in some form, some fashion, and they're beautiful different kinds of art. 
So why do we feel like our homes are only going to be beautiful in one particular design fashion? Um, this is one where it was very traditionally done. These people had really wanted to have a habitat garden and they did get a lot of shelter spaces, but it really was not providing what they wanted. Now to some people, they would say that is absolutely beautiful. And to me, I can see the symmetry and such, but it's not beautiful because it has no additional value. It's got one value and that is human eyeballs, nothing else. And to me, this is their after photo where they have all sorts of plants incorporated into those same spaces now that do a job in addition to making our eyeballs happy. They provide nectar, they provide pollen, they provide foliage, they provide food for the other creatures and shelter. Um, the burning bushes will eventually go away and be substituted for a different choice, but it's a really good start to look at what we can do to add in. It's not always got to be an entire prairie in your front yard. We can just add things in. And dandelions are something that we hear a lot about. You know, people talk about don't mow the dandelions, leave them for the bees. And dandelions are not a native plant. But one of the things that I've really thought about lately is when you go into these homes and there's either something like this on the wall or there's a piece of art or there's a t-shirt, whatever it might be, that has these blowing seeds in the wind to make us think of making wishes. And yet I often wonder if the children in those homes have ever had the experience of blowing those seeds away because if they don't have dandelions, how will they ever make a wish on a dandelion? So it's kind of like the creatures that go extinct before we expected our children to be able to know them. Once they're gone, they're gone. And just with the plants, once they're gone, they're gone. As a child, we had a lush zoysia lawn. It was always like walking on carpet. And yet we made chains with the blooms from the clovers and we blew the heads off dandelions and we snapped the little popping heads off dandelions. We won't talk about what we did to the lightning bugs, but if people don't have lightning bugs, then they need to stop spraying their yard and they need to leave their leaves because that's how you get dandelion, or get, dandelion get lightning bugs. If you're doing all those other things to kill the things that you think are so terrible, a lot of times you're also killing the things that aren't terrible and that we want to incorporate into our lives. So keeping nature near, that's one of our goals is it doesn't have to be over there, away from us somewhere. We want it to be with us so that we can experience it all the time instead of having to go somewhere to a park or a conservation area to experience nature, let's bring it with us into our homes. There's a couple of little blurbs of information here on the Missouri Invasive Task Force, um, Missouri Prairie Foundation, you already know if you're following this through Grow Native, what wonderful services they provide. So check them out. 20 years of work from Grow Native, and they've made a magnificent difference in incorporating nature into our homes and into our lives on a daily basis, instead of on the rare occasions that we can set everything else aside and go out somewhere else. Felicia, are you there? I know that there's questions to follow up. Uh, I, I'm here, this is Carol David. I'm the director of the Missouri oh. Prairie Foundation. Thank you, Paula, that was wonderful. And I loved all of your slides and your examples. And we do have a number of questions. Um, one is from Val. She says, yikes, violets, they have invaded my sunny garden and I'm afraid they will prevent installation or 
of any additional native plants I want to add. Deer do eat down the freshest leaves, so now they just look dreadful. Have you had experience with such a problem? Um, I have a lot of violets in my own yard. And in my experience, all the other plants grow right up through the violets and the violets become the green mulch. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that it's not only the deer who eat those leaves down for you, it's also caterpillars. So they are host plants as well. Um, it's, it's just one of those things that we have got in our mindset a specific idea of there should be mulch, there should be space, all those things, but I have no issues with my plants not coming up right through the violets as a cover. Thanks, Paula. Um, I have that experience with my yard. In fact, I've got areas where I wish the violets would come in amongst the natives. Um, but yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, question from um, Oh, I just, where is it here? Oh, question about, um, do you have any advice on, um, can you recommend any books that, um, sorry, that I just lost it here. Uh, somebody just added a question. Just one moment, please. Can you recommend any books that show how to mix hardscape with natives? How to mix hardscape with natives. Hmm. I mean, there's, I have books under my laptop so that you weren't looking up my nose because I got tired of that. I don't know about everybody else that all these new Zoom meetings and Zoom newscasts, you're looking up everybody's nose because they didn't lift their laptop. Um, Gardening with Prairie Plants by the Wasowskis is a good one. And you'll see examples of hardscape I don't know personally of a particular book that covers those two topics together intentionally, um, but there's Landscape Revolution, which is a good one. And I'm sorry, I can't say the name of the author right this second. Landscape Revolution is the name of it. Um, he was one of the presenters at Planet Native last year here in Kansas City with Deep Roots. Um, gosh, I can't say his name for anything, I'm sorry. And that's my timer, so I'm supposed to stop talking now. Oh. Um, so those are two that I know do incorporate some of that, but I don't know of a particular book that really nails those two together. Um, thanks, Paula. Um, another question. Um, I'm having trouble with moles in my shade garden. I won't use poison. Any suggestions? So many tunnels disrupt the roots of my plants. I have that same issue. Um, and we bought one of those little guillotine things and I just couldn't do it. <laughs> so, I, I just couldn't. <laughs> It just didn't seem right that I want to attract all the animals and all the other creatures, but only the ones that I want and not the ones that I don't want. It's kind of like when people want to plant a butterfly garden, but they don't want it to attract bees also because maybe somebody would get stung. Um, you know, it's save your seeds so if they actually kill a plant, but they're not eating your roots. Moles are going to be eating they're they're carnivores so they're eating grubs and things like that so yeah they come and they make tunnels and i figure that gives me the points of equaling exercise when i mow because of all the jiggling that's going on with the moles but um yeah i mean i know a friend who she uses a hose and floods the tunnel i just i've decided i need to learn to just let them live their lives too so Thanks, Paula. There was a, a note from Diane about moles. She says, beneficial nematodes will kill grubs that will remove the mole's food source. So that's an idea. A um, couple of comments from folks about the hardscape question. Um, oh, boy, they keep coming in, so they jump. OK, the <laughs> Garden Revolution book is by Larry Weiner. Thank you, yes. And um, also, uh, James says, natural stone usually looks great with native plants. Books on native 
on natural stone landscaping would be a good direction to go. And there are some great stone artscaping by Dan Snow that are great. And if I could just add, there's a um, um, landscape designer in, um, I think he's based in Granite City, Illinois, Chris. Um, oh gosh, his name just escaped me. Maybe Felicia will text me and show <laughs> his name. But he is with Studio Land Arts and he does some really interesting things, um, mixing in sort of playful structures, native plants, and Chris Carl, thank you, Felicia. Chris Carl, and um, he will do things like um, make towers out of out of asphalt chunks to sort of rewild urban spaces, and it's very interesting. interesting. So you can look up Chris Carl's um, work. It's just another idea. Um, so another uh, uh, note here: Mole's diet is more earthworms than grubs. Perhaps MU extension. Uh, our healthy yards for clean streams uh, might have some other suggestions. Um, someone else says prairie king snakes will eat moles. <laughs> um, so that's another idea. And that gets to what you were talking about, Paula, too, of just if we have, you know, maybe we have spaces for other creatures that can help control the mole population, too. Um, let's see, another co uh, question. Um, uh, Oh, someone asked, I missed the first half of the seminar, but where do you get those signs? And I'm not sure which signs, I'm, I'm guessing maybe the Grow Native signs that Paula showed, although she showed some other signs, but the um, Grow Native signs, you can go to grownative.org and go to gift shop or shop at the top and you can find, um, you can buy those signs there. But Paula- um, Carol, some... isn't it on mpf.org now? It, it's on, or yeah, it, well, it, it should be on both. Uh, yeah, but you okay, can go I didn't to, know if the old website was still connecting. Uh, it, it, it should be either on moprairie.org, uh, but yeah, you can you can go to moprairie.org. Paula, were there other signs that you wanted to comment on? Um, there was one that was um, from Monarch Watch, which is through KU, and that was certifying as a Monarch Way Station. They have certain criteria that you go through and you check off and you tell them yes or no, so they you go on their website and there's a list of do you meet these criteria and then you purchase the sign after you become certified as a monarch way station um, national wildlife federation also has one where you can certify as a backyard habitat north american butterfly association has one where you can certify as a habitat for butterflies there's a lot of different options out there and if you're wanting one that's not necessarily certifying you as this or that type of habitat you can also just purchase signs and there's all kinds of additional types of designs out there um, Etsy and places like that if you just google native plant signage and things like that you'll see all kinds of different stuff come up but I really like the Prairie Foundation ones because they give a short blurb of explanation for what these plants are doing and of course the proceeds benefit Missouri Prairie Foundation so there's a dual cause there. Thank you. Um, a couple questions here. Speaking of violets, I have several places in the yard that violets don't enjoy. How can I encourage them? Or is there something else I can put in as a living mulch, particularly in dry areas? Um, well, I don't know whether, you know, how much sun we're talking about, but one that's really good in dry shade, because since you're mentioning violets, I'm wondering if it's shady is the pussy toes. Um, they take all kinds of dry at the base of my pin oak trees and they are not a super aggressive spreader. They're a host plant. They're really cute. They stay super low to the ground. They're fuzzy, so they're textural. Um, and there's a, a prairie pussy toes and there's the woodland pussy toes so you can get something for shade or for sun. Um, another one that I like in sun that is more of plugging it in, it doesn't multiply very aggressively at all, is prairie smoke, um, GM triflorum. And that's a really nice one that gives you a long season of interest as well. Great, thanks. Um, someone else had another question uh, about any other low growing natives, violets, fine fescue, Pennsylvania sedge, what else? Um, if I could just uh, add 
another resource that might help people too is we have a video on the um, MPF YouTube channel on some natives for dry shade and that might be helpful but I'm sure um, Paula has some other suggestions too. Oh gosh there's so many I mean we we so often don't think about shady areas as being dry we kind of have in our mind sometimes when we imagine shade that it's cool and moist but that's if we're living in Seattle so here in Missouri it's oftentimes really really dry so even the um, Pacara is a great one, the hardy geraniums, what all do I have in the shade? There's so many different ones. Um, Monarda bradburiana is a nice short growing one. Uh, wild ginger, it, once it's established, it's really adaptable too. There's just so many. Definitely go on the website and check out those top 10 lists because there will be one for that group of plants. Thanks, Paul. And, and Felicia, tomorrow she'll send out an email and we'll put in those links to that video and to those top 10 lists too. So you can refer to those later. Um, there's several questions about, um, I might be kind of paraphrasing several of them about um, recommending what do you do with bare soil areas around newly planted natives? Well, there's a lot of different perspectives on that. I have a a strong fondness for a type of mulch that's called pine straw and basically it's harvested in the southern pine forests and it's really really long pine needles it lasts really nicely so I typically put down a layer of the non-slick cardboard around the plants so that we don't have weeds the, tr the true weeds the weeds we don't want popping up from which is usually turf grass uh, from underneath and then putting the pine straw over the top it's super easy that way because if you use landscape fabric and you put mulch on top of that and you don't remove the mulch then you just keep adding mulch then you have created soil on top of that fabric which is a great home for any kind of weeds that you don't want to fight. Um, there's also the idea of with the pine straw there's a lot more air circulation and it's harvested in a sustainable manner. It used to be available in a bale that was exactly like a straw bale because it was just tied with twine. Now they've started selling it here in town that it's wrapped in plastic, which I am very annoyed by, but it's still my favorite type of mulch. It's lighter weight that I can carry it myself. And it just, it, it seems to allow a lot of air movement. It gives the teeny tiny babies a little bit of support structurally so that they're not laying flat on the ground if there's a hard rain or something. So that's my own personal go-to for using mulch. Great. Um, question of, um, from Jeanette. Um, she says, I know some people see rabbits as a pest, but I haven't seen as many rabbits as I used to in the past. Is there a plant I can plant to attract them? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Um, well, in my yard, one of their favorite dishes is the purple prairie clover. They love that. I've never successfully grown it because they eat it down to nothing. Um, honestly, just about any native plant is going to give them something that they like. Uh, rabbits are pretty wide ranging in their ability to eat. They're not quite as specific as so many other creatures are. A lot of my people that I deal with have a lot of difficulty keeping their plants from being totally destroyed by rabbits. So that's kind of a fun one. Um, we have an article written by uh, Marcus uh, Wallace from Missouri Wildflowers Nursery on, on plants that deer and rabbits tend to like and ones that they tend to avoid. And we'll um, share that in the email tomorrow. Um, that might help as well. Um, let's see, when is the best time to plant Laetra spicata? I have 25 plants in pots ready to go into the ground. You know, I plant Anytime the ground is not frozen so hard that I can't put a shovel into it. Um, I don't do that for other people in the colder temperatures, but I literally have planted some of seedling trees from Forest Keeling in January after the Western Trade Show. 
I was able to get a shovel in, I stuck them in the ground and I got quite a few trees from that. So, you know, the, these plants are very adaptable. What we have to look at is do we have the ability to get them water when they need it? Because during that first establishment time, they do need some help with moisture because Missouri is insane weather and we are have spent our money on these plants and we want them to survive instead of just waiting to see what can happen there. We want the ones that we've planted to survive. So they take a little bit of care. You know, we wanna keep out the aggressive weeds while they're establishing and we want to give them water when they need it, which is not necessarily on a schedule. It's more about what the weather brings about for us, whether when and how much to water. Um, back to the rabbits, Ken says, I have lots of rabbits. How many do you want? They are <laughs> plants, including Machinacea. Please, please connect us so we can help this lady. Who wants the rabbit? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, um, Val had a couple questions about tall plants. How do you keep tall plants from flopping over? Do you stake? And I think she had an earlier question about kind of spring haircuts, about appropriate times to trim some plants down. Could you, uh, to maybe keep them more compact, could you speak about that, Paula? Um, I usually give people a date of July 4th, not because it's a set in stone date, but because it's an easy one to remember. And so plants like New England Aster, that it's a later bloomer, you can keep on chopping that puppy. We've cut it back all the way into October um, in some of our maintenance things with the Master Gardener group that it, it, it still bloomed into December and some in January. So it's kind of uh, amazing how adaptable it is. Um, things like sweet coneflower, you know, once you get too close to when the blooms are actually gonna open, you can still cut it back to have compactness, but you may miss out on your bloom time if you cut too late. One of the things that I do as far as staking, um, there's all kinds of different things out there. You know, even a tomato cage, if you put it over them when they're smaller, that'll help to support them structurally. And it's also, we need to be planting a few of the smaller shrubs like lead plant, um, like New Jersey tea, and some of the grasses like prairie drop seed and little blue stem because those are the things that within that natural environment give the structural support to the forbs, the blooming things that we are more tending to start off with when we're doing um, our gardening endeavors. Okay, thanks. Um, there's a question about um, recommendations for, um, let's see, I'm trying to find this. What do you suggest for the quote tree lawn between the street and sidewalk. I think different communities may call these spaces. I know in Jefferson City where I live, they're called greenways, but in a lot of places they're called tree lawns. That strip of grass between sidewalks and streets that the cities, cities usually own that, but they're the responsibility of the landowner. So mm -hmm. what would you suggest for this area between the street and sidewalk, full sun? And there was a related question. Do you have suggestions for a good, um, it says good boulevard tree. I'm, 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 I'm wondering if that, they mean sort of a strip of, you know, within a boulevard or along a street. Well, as far as, I mean, a lot of people that I know call that the hell strip between the uh, public sidewalk and the street. And sometimes there's been a tree planted there by the city. Sometimes it's just boring grass that you have to mow and if you're wanting to keep up with everybody else, you have to keep the weeds out of it and all of that. Um, a lot of it depends upon your line of sight for cars and humans entering and exiting driveways and sidewalks and things like that. If you're in an area where that's not an issue, then you could go with some taller plants like prairie drop seed or side oats grama. Um, Oftentimes we end up putting like the prairie smoke or some of the pussy toes, depending upon the shade sun um, exposure or what else would work in those areas. Hairy wild petunias don't get terribly thick, but they're a nice addition. Um, the Campanula rotundifolia, the harebell does well in areas like that. 
and what else do we put in there? Um, the Missouri Evening Primrose will work there. There's, there's a lot of different options. It's just more dependent upon salt tolerance and your line of sight and visibility because if you put something too large there, then you've created a hazard for pedestrians and for folks that are driving in and out of driveways. So that's that's the, the criteria you really need to look for more than, because there's all kinds of things that'll grow and dry without needing to be additional watering once they're established. But they, they will probably need, depending upon the time of year, they'll probably need some help that first year um, to be, keep them healthy. Great, thank you. And I just wanted to add, uh, Scott Woodbury with Shaw Nature Reserve, he just wrote an article about tree line gardens and it's going to appear in the next Gateway Gardener news, newspaper, uh, magazine publication, I think maybe not till July or August. Um, let's see, uh, did you want to- explain that Gateway Gardener is a St. Louis area. Yeah, St. Louis, that's a St. Louis publication, but it's also online as well. Mm -hmm. um, and let's see, gosh, we've got a lot more questions if you've got time, um, uh, Paula. Um, did you have advice on maybe some uh, street trees? Oh gosh, there's so many great trees. Um, in fact, there was just a list that someone sent me, so I'm pulling it up, that uh, all of the things in their neighborhood were ash trees and they've been killed off and so some of the things that their municipality is recommending here in the Kansas City area, I'm not sure how wonderful some of these choices would be for those. They've got um, black gums, sawtooth oak, shingle oak, sugar maple, swamp white oak, and white oak. Again, a lot of it is going to depend upon the soil conditions there. Are they super compact? Are they getting a lot of moisture because the lay of the land allows the water to run down and kind of pool there? Or are they going to be super dry? Is it an area where folks, everybody runs an irrigation system and so there's going to be moisture that gets to them? A lot of it is going to depend upon the individual situation any of the larger stronger trees will be great the best idea would be for not every person on the block to plant the same exact tree because then we end up with the same sorts of situations as we are with the emerald ash borer losing all of the ashes so all of the trees of that age group in an entire neighborhood sometimes in an entire city um, and like with the elm disease, the Dutch elm disease, all the elms were gone. So a lot of times an entire street or an entire area lost all of their mature trees. So think biodiversity and not everybody in the same area plant all the same tree. Yeah, that's a really good point. And we have a Gernative top 10 list about small, small trees for small landscapes, which doesn't doesn't exactly address the question, but if, if any of you are interested in some smaller native trees, we'll be sure to share that um, top 10 list. Um, there's there's some also, sorry Carol, there's also a group called Great Trees for KC, um, and they're not all native recommendations, but they do have different types of trees in different groupings, so they do have ones that they recommend. Um, and many of them are native trees that they recommend. Yeah, great. Melanie has a comment about utilities really like it when people plant shorter trees. So shorter trees are a good option too if you've got some over, overhead um, utility right. wires. And we have a top 10 list for that as well. So we'll be sure to get that out. Um, there's a few things here maybe we can um, answer quickly. A couple questions about, Paula, where do you find this, the pine straw? around where you are in the Kansas City area? In the Kansas City area, there is a wholesale nursery called CAT, K-A-T, that carries it. So if you know anyone with an EIN, an employee identification number, they can uh, help you purchase those. Um, also, Suburban in the Kansas City area carries them not always, but frequently. 
So sometimes uh, you have to buy up a supply when you find it. And Paula, do you, I mean, I, I just mentioned Kansas City since you're from the Kansas City area. I'm not sure where, where these folks live who have, a, do you know of any other places in Missouri that carry it? I, I really don't know outside of this area. Um, you know, in, in other parts of the country, my sister lives in North Carolina. They come with these giant trucks. They pull up to your house. They say, how much do you need? You tell them what to mulch. They mulch it. They move to the next house. Uh, but here in the Midwest, we have to do a little more searching for it. Great. Uh, um, and let's see, uh, someone asks, are, we're new to St. Louis. Can we use this amazing prairie information for our garden in St. Louis? And I think, yes, resoundedly, yes. You can use many prairie plants from Missouri's prairies in your gardens. And, and many, many of them are available through Grow Native professional members who sell them. Did you... Want to add anything to that, Paula? No, I think you covered it. <laughs> and then let's see, um, someone asked, where do we uh, post these webinars? Um, th this is, will be rec is, is being recorded and it will be available on Facebook and also on, on YouTube. So it'll be available on Facebook immediately uh, when, when we end this afternoon and then it'll be YouTube in, in a day or so. So they are posted there. Um, let's see, uh, on the, uh, back on those, uh, uh, lawn, garden lawn, or the strips, the house strips, um, mm -hmm. Felicia shared she's had good luck with purple, purple poppy mallow and path rush in those strips. Um, oh, I, path rush is a good option. The, the only concern I have with purple poppy mallow in that area, um, is the potential for it being a trip hazard. I love purple poppy mallow in the right location and it would definitely be happy and survive in that space. My concern with that though is it doesn't recognize the edges of a sidewalk and if you would be liable for a person who was walking along tripping because of the purple poppy mallow that could be something I'd be cautious of. And that becomes a maintenance thing where you've got to keep it cut back and I hate maintenance. That's a good point. I've used uh, drop seed in my little area and I, it's upright, it stays put, it looks nice and uniform. Um, and of course you mentioned many other great ideas, Paula. Another question, is there a native ground cover that does well in full sun that would also do well in a large container? She has a friend who has an old canoe and she plants, she plants in and would like a low growing perennial that she could plant and ignore most of the time. Oh, that would be so cool. Yeah, that's that's big enough. I don't think that would even be like a container type of an environment. Um, gosh, I think it all depends on color scheme and height that you're looking for because there are so many different ones from wild strawberries, which then you would have something edible if you get the actual wild strawberries, not the barren. Um, gosh, there's so many options. Felicia, that would be a fun place to put the purple poppy mallow, too. Yeah. Felicia is suggesting rose verbena. Oh, yeah. That's a good one there. It does tend to jump around on its own sometimes, but if you're okay with that, then that's a great one. And great. it smells good, too. Yeah, you're, yeah, you're right. Uh, let's see. Um, killing lawn to start a small native prairie-style garden in the fall. Full sun, southern slope, dry clay site. Any suggestions for good native grasses to use? Gosh, are there any that wouldn't work there? Maybe northern sea oats wouldn't be the best option there, or river oats. Um, I mean, little blue stem would do fine. Prairie drop seed should do fine. Side oats grama should do fine. So yeah, I, I don't, I think it would be a longer list of what will succeed than what wouldn't because there'd just be so few that wouldn't be able to deal with that. Even Amsonia would be a good thing to stick in a spot like that. Um, even though it's not a grass, it's got kind of the same form and habit if you're looking for that type of weight in a, unless you're doing just a, a mixed prairie, but if you're looking for a designed issue, then the, that would give you that same vertical element and the same weight. Thanks, Paula. And if anybody is wanting to do prairie gardens from seed, 
um, next Wednesday's webinar with Jared Hubner, that could re be really helpful. He'll be looking at it more, more, more from the from a seated landscape, not so much design. So like Paula mm -hmm. said, it would depend if you know you really want to have some control over how you're designing it or if it's something that you're doing with seed. Um, let's see, do you um what what about plantain? Do you just let plantain go or do you try to weed it out? Um, in my own home, I let it go because Anytime you have a mosquito bite or any other irritant on your skin, all you have to do is smush up one of those leaves, rub it on there. You could also eat it for a salad, um, you know, but if you're in an HOA kind of a place, it's probably not one that you want to have fill your entire yard, but there's no reason you couldn't have a little patch of it that was very defined to show that you intended for it to grow there and weren't just negligent in your maintenance. Thanks. Another question. I have a lot of liriope. Any plant ideas to replace them? <laughs> <laughs> so many. <laughs> Anything on the grow native list would replace liriope, but um, your, your biggest challenge is going to be eliminating the liriope to begin with. Um, and I really don't know of something as far as competition wise, you know, maybe shrubs and I don't even know if the grasses as big as little blue stem and such would be able to fight liriope. It's so aggressive. Um, but you could definitely stuff some shrubs into that space, you know, even little lead plants or something like that. They'd be hardy enough to fight their own way with them. Um, American Beautyberry and things like that. As far as replacements for it, Again, it comes down to, is it shade or sun? Because liriope will live in just about any environment. Um, and how much moisture do you have? How much height do you want it to have? There's so many beautiful plants that would be much better for the rest of the creatures than the liriope is. Thanks, Paula. Um, just a, another comment someone had where they they have really hard soil and they like the moles because it helps uh, water infiltrate. So I thought that was a nice comment. Um, let's see here. Um, oh, any suggestions on good companions for lead plant? I love to put um, the butterfly milkweed, Asclepius tuberosa with the lead plant just because their bloom is pretty synchronized and I love to see the orange of the butterfly milkweed pull out the orange in the bloom of the lead plant. That's just me. Oh, that's nice. I, that is a lovely, that's lovely, Paula. Question, my flower bed faces west, shady with dappled sun. Any recommendations for flowering plants? So uh, again, you know, there, it's harder to narrow it down. Um, downy skull cap, the Indian pinks, if you're not getting, you know, you say it's mostly dappled sun, so it doesn't sound like it would get like beating sun at the end of the day. So Indian pinks would be good there. Hardy geranium, wild ginger. The possibilities are multitudinous. Melanie asks, uh, what are your favorites and why? <laughs> Do we have two hours? <laughs> oh, it, that's not enough time, Carol. <laughs> it seems like every plant that I'm talking about at that moment is my favorite. Mm -hmm. um, gosh, and for so many different reasons. I mean, like Rattlesnake Master, I think is such an unsung hero because it gets so many of these little teeny tiny pollinators on its blooms. And if you're working in a bed type of space and you start to smell something that smells really good and you're going, oh, where's that? What bloom is that coming from? And it's the rattlesnake master. And who thinks of that as being this yummy smelling blossom and, and pollinators are just all over it, little teeny tiny ones. And like Atris, you know, the rough and the Eastern blazing star. I love those because it's so much fun to see how many monarchs will come on one of those plants to drink from it when they're migrating south and then any caterpillar host plant. And yeah, it, there's no way on earth I could choose <laughs> even a handful of favorites. 
Well, Pa, I like what you said. Any, you know, anything at that moment, and, and native plants do give us so many moments, don't they? We, we oh. anticipate their bloom. We, it's fun to see what's visiting them, and that, that is something so special about natives. It's not something that's blooming all season long, never changing. With natives, it's never changing. the same from year to year either. Yeah. People that's often are confused because they say, oh, well, this isn't doing as well this year as it did last year. And, you know, there's, it's just like with people, if we eat more than we do, better or worse, depending upon the degree of that. And if we have more rain or less rain or a windy, windy storm versus a not windy storm, there's so many variables that our gardens, it's not only the sequence of blooms and the sequence of interactions that we see, but it's also that it's constantly changing. It's always new and fresh. Every year it's a little bit different than it was the year before. Thanks, Paula. Can you take one more question? Of course. Um, Kathy asks, do you have any secrets for dealing with hungry deer? Okay, this is what I do in my yard. And they have no fear of my two big giant dogs that thank you, miraculously, they have stayed unbarking during this whole time. <laughs> what I do is, it's gonna sound kind of goofy, but when I plant a new plant, and it's a little tiny baby, because I'm cheap, I take, we, again, we have pin oaks all around the property line that were planted when we bought it. And um, so of course there's lots of limbs always on the ground. There's little branches here and there everywhere. So I break off sticks that are, you know, 10 inches or so long, 15 inches, just depends on what's nearest at my hand and whether I want to break it or stick it in that size. But so uh, I don't know how this will work, but pretend this is the plant itself. And if I have a bunch of little sticks, I will stick them in a little caged circle around the individual plant. And it's not 100% because I have a million and thousand squirrels. So anybody who had the bunny thing, if there's anybody that likes squirrels, I'll <laughs> happily ship you a few thousand. <laughs> the squirrels will still stick their little fingers in there and dig out the plant and eat the roots if they're hungry enough or thirsty enough. But the deer tend to mosey along that if they put their head down and they poke their nose on those, they move on to something different. I don't often find, other than my dogs having bulldozed them, there's nobody that really like digs them out when they're surrounded by those little sticks. It's not, like I said, it's not foolproof, but it seems to really have helped. Thanks, Paula. Um, Diane suggests Milorganite fertilizer is great for keeping deer away, at least a six inch wide strip by at least one, one foot deep. I, uh, Maybe long, maybe she means long. Hmm. Um, not something I've ever tried. And sometimes we have to be cautious of fertilizer with native plants because sometimes they'll grow too quickly on top of the soil where they'll be lanky and kind of wonky instead of getting that root system established first before they put on that big rush of growth above ground. Um, it's one of those things we kind of forget that there's more biomass below the surface of a prairie soil than there is above it, and there's a whole lot above it. So it's, um, we, we have to be a little bit cautious with something like that. It's just not something that I have any experience one way or the other, but that would be my own personal first thought would be, eh, maybe be cautious, move yeah. it out away from the plant you're trying to protect, perhaps. Yeah, and that's a good point. And I, Diane, I apologize. I, um, it, she, she wrote six inches wide by at least just one inch deep. So she did mean deep, but you have a good po point, Paula. I'll add that I, I have problems with deer myself. I use um, liquid fence spray mm -hmm. it's a, or it's a, it's a all, it's natural ingredients. It's like fermented eggs and garlic. It smells horrible, but I'll go out and spray my na natives that they tend to nibble on every week or so. Um, it's not foolproof, but it does seem to help somewhat. Oh, and Diane, she, on the Millorganite, she spreads it outside of the plant beds. Ah, okay. Um, let's see. Um, and it smells horrible, she says. It also, <laughs> so you have to have a high tolerance for things that smell bad. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I think I got 
all the questions, uh, we'll, we, but if there are any that we missed, we will um, connect them to Paula if she doesn't mind and we can get an answer. And like I said, tomorrow Felicia will put together an email with um, resources that Paula mentioned and a few others that were shared um, throughout the, through, through this presentation. And um, Paula, any, any last thing you'd like to add? All I can say is don't hesitate to get started if you haven't started yet, because I always warn people who are starting to learn about native plants that it is an addiction. So be prepared to either supplement your income or cut your expenses somewhere else because that gateway bug of the monarchs, the first native plant you plant is the milkweed and you start to see the caterpillars and the butterflies and then you're like, oh, what about that other one? And it's a slippery slope from there. You'll just be enamored of all the different creatures that start to interact with these plants instead of it just being a sterile lump of green. <laughs> well, Paula, thank you so much for all that you do to promote natives. And this was a wonderful presentation. There are many appreciative remarks. You've got lots of fan mail here. So thanks again, Paula. Thanks everybody for tuning in. And um, if uh, next week, we'll have another webinar on establishing prairie planting. So if, uh, do tune, tune in for that. And if you can also share uh, Paula's presentation, we'll be on YouTube here in, in just a couple of days. And so thanks again, Paula. Have a good night, everyone. Everybody. <laughs>